welcome to my talk about threat detection in the cloud with uh, Spark and uh, Python. The purpose of this talk is uh, some sort of uh, overview of uh, the technologies I've been working on uh, for the past maybe six months. Um, and you know, in order to build some kind of data pipeline that ultimately uh, the goal was to uh, build some kind of uh, threat map for our customers. Uh, and as you will see and can expect, most of the pipeline is using Python, otherwise I wouldn't be here. Um, but uh, actually, we have a high focus on, on Python in the company, so we wanted to see uh, how much we can use Python along the way. Also, since we're dealing with scale, I will try as much as possible uh, to give you some uh, tips about how to use the different, different technologies um, with uh, how to handle scale and uh, how not to uh, uh, get into the traps that uh, I've fallen uh, into. And uh, I, I wish I had those tips uh, six months ago, so I, I'm, uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, some of you, at least that are working in the same field, uh, will be pleased uh, to get them. But very first of all, just a, a few words about uh, my background. So I was born in France, uh, just maybe you, uh, you have guessed by, by my accent. Uh, and uh, after getting my PhD in bioinformatics a few years afterwards, I decided to uh, leave everything behind and move to Israel, where I happily live with my wife and kid for almost several years now. And I'm working for a startup uh, called CloudLock, and I will get back to it uh, in a few minutes. If I had to pick four things that I like uh, to talk about and to monitor, I would pick Python, of course, um, and uh, Ansible, which is a configuration management tool uh, written in Python. Docker, uh, if uh, some people are not familiar with uh, this uh, hype of Docker, uh, I would uh, really suggest you to uh, um, uh, get informed about it because it's really cool, though it's written in Go. And finally, Spark, uh, which I discovered a few uh, months back when I was looking for a tool in order to uh, do some data processing uh, at scale using Python. So where I'm working, I'm working with a small company called uh, CloudLock. Not so small, actually, uh, currently, because uh, we have more than uh, 100 um, uh, employees, both in um, US, in Ukraine, and, uh, and here in Tel Aviv. We have a uh, product uh, for enterprises. We're specialized in cybersecurity in the cloud. And in the cloud is important because it's just like a different market than just uh, on-premise uh, cybersecurity. And we're dealing with scale, as you can see here, um, with uh, a lot of uh, apps, more than 150 thousand uh, apps that we're dealing with uh, in the cloud, more than 10 million of users that we're monitoring all the time, and more than 4 billion of uh, user activity that we're monitoring also in order to find some suspicious activity. In order to better understand uh, what I'm working on, I just want to give you some kind of uh, short background on cybersecurity and, and what's differ different in the cloud than, uh, than on other uh, areas. In the cloud, um, there are three major areas uh, where security is important and three different type of threats. Uh, first of all, if you're looking to your identity, so your account, your account can be compromised uh, by a hacker. If you're looking into apps, you can install a lot of apps on your, uh, on your desktop, and you can also, um, the threat there is actually that you can also uh, install malware that can compromise the whole uh, company. And finally, all the data that you have that, that you own uh, can be breached, and, you can, uh, and the, data, the data can be uh, leaked online uh, in the internet or be shared um, uh, with uh, third parties. So these, these are actually the, the three uh, major areas that we're trying to, uh, to monitor. Things are getting a little bit more complicated because people are dealing with multiple providers. For example, not only you have, you're using uh, Google Apps, but maybe you're also uh, saving your files on Dropbox or ServiceNow. One interesting um, uh, property is that then you need to deal with several providers, each one uh, being uh, a threat on itself. So when you're working in the cloud, um, you really need to uh, see if we can uh, find some correlated data um, because when you are breached on one area, maybe you can be breached in the other. The whole idea of what we uh, wanted to uh, work on was to be able to build some kind of data pipeline, taking as an input all the events that we're getting from, the, from third parties, from, pro from providers, just like uh, Office or uh, from Google, um, process them using some, a lot of different uh, algorithms, machine learning algorithms, 
in order to detect anomalies and suspicious activity. And finally, the output of that would be some kind of map where customers can actually see uh, where they have some, uh, some breaches or some suspicious activity they, they can uh, look on. So the first part is actually data collection. And here, uh, we're leveraging the APIs of, uh, of uh, Google Drive, Salesforce, uh, Office 365. We're supporting a, a lot of different um, um, uh, platforms. And we're either using auth or we're getting directly the events through Webhook. And here, we're using Celery. And uh, I, I will give you some, uh, uh, some of the issues that we, uh, we encounter using Celery at scale. Uh, because we're using Celery and uh, RabbitMQ um, in combination. Here you can see that we're using Celery workers in order to actually collect the data, and then we're sending them through Rabbit uh, to another step of normalization, since one of the problems that we have is that we have multiple sources, but we want to only have one source of truth at the end, so we need to normalize the data. So what were the different uh, issues that we uh, encountered with Celery? With Celery, by default, um, it expects that you're returning some kind of results. Now, the results, uh, if you're using uh, Redis as the back end, are saved into Redis. The problem is that, in, in our case, uh, we had a lot, a lot of tasks, uh, but we didn't care about the results. And at the beginning, if you uh, don't care about the results, well, you're just uh, saving a lot of objects, the redundant objects in Redis. So if you don't care about the results, there is a nice uh, parameter that you can add uh, to your task definition, which is ignore result equals true. The other uh, parameter that you can uh, play with is called max shall task per node. Uh, this is a parameter that um, is interesting because it actually controls the number of tasks um, before the interpreter getting killed. So if you're caching some data, for example, uh, we're caching some data that we, uh, we didn't want to calculate over uh, every task. Um, if, if you are caching some data, but the max uh, child task is very small, then you're just computing over and over the same thing, and you don't, uh, don't use your uh, cache data. So here, you can just uh, increase the value of that, um, and you will have better performance because you will leverage more the cache data. But on the other hand, uh, you may, uh, uh, you may um, uh, have some problem with uh, some memory leak, for example. So just uh, make sure to uh, find the right balance. Another limitation we had is that Celery can only work with RabbitMQ. And since we had some issues when we tried to scale RabbitMQ, uh, we wanted to, uh, to use several ones uh, for different sort of tasks. But it's not possible because it's not supported. So we. Uh, started by uh, actually um, writing some uh, other code in order to do that uh, over Celery, which is not very, very easy. And um, another interesting uh, property of Celery is that uh, all the nodes are actually talking to the, uh, one to the other. And they're talking through uh, Rabbit. They're sending messages one to the other to make sure they're still alive. And when you have a lot of tasks, it's very chatty. So uh, RabbitMQ, but actually, there, there were a lot of queues that were just uh, heartbeat from, uh, from Celery. There is not so much that you can do about it, but you need to uh, make sure that your rabbit uh, has enough capacity in order to handle uh, the, those heartbeats. And finally, there is an, a nice new uh, feature that is still experimental. Uh, it's called batching mode. So what happens is that uh, when you are consuming messages from the queue uh, in Celery, uh, by default, uh, it uses a um, parameter called prefetch, so we can actually fetch a bunch of tasks at once instead of just one by one. Uh, the problem is still that Celery is processing the task one, one by one. Uh, with batching mode, um, you can actually decide that you want to uh, process all those tasks at once. And what is interesting, because one of the things that we're doing with Celery is, for example, to send the, uh, the events into Elasticsearch, and Elasticsearch is working better when you are actually sending uh, uh, batches of, uh, of documents there. Now, um, data cleaning, normalization, and enrichment. Once you collected data, you need to clean it up, of course. You need to normalize it because we're using uh, different uh, sources. And finally, you want to enrich it. There's not so much to say apart from the fact that um, we had a lot of work in the mapping field because each provider is actually using a very different schema. 
And if we're talking about schema, one thing that you should really uh, care about, uh, be careful about is to make sure that you're versioning your schema from day one, because you will never know what will happen with that afterwards. Uh, you, you want to be to, to stay backward compatible so, and, and detect when you change the schema, so you better version it. In terms of data enrichment, since in our uh, events we had information about the IP address of the customer, uh, we, had a, we had a lot of different options in order to enrich the, the data. Uh, we used some geolocation data in order to know exactly where the, uh, um, the event uh, has been uh, occurring, and that will help us afterwards in order to put that on a map. And also, uh, we have uh, some feed about IP reputation, which uh, also is an indicator whether or not uh, the activity is uh, suspicious. Um, and finally, uh, we also implemented some kind of early uh, sensitive activity detection just by the fact that, uh, for example, let's say you have a login failure as an activity, uh, or you have a bunch of, activity of uh, login, login failures, you can already say that something is kind of uh, suspicious. Not one, but maybe if you have a string one after the other, then you can uh, uh, see that something is, is kind of fishy. And um, since most of this is actually um, calling API, third-party APIs, we use gevent in order to get better performance. We have all the data that is uh, collected, enriched, and now, uh, and this was done a whole by, by, by a team called the UBA team, the User Behavior Analysis team, um, and now we're moving to the other team, which I'm proud of, called the Cyber Intelligence, uh, whose um, goal was actually more to focus on, the, on producing a thread feed and visualizing on a map. So the first uh, task that uh, I had to do is to uh, take all those events that are uh, saved in, uh, in F3, and using Logstash, um, move that to another bucket, but there uh, the, uh, the data is encrypted. We had to do that because of compliance uh, regulation, and um, we used Logstash, which had, uh, we, we had a couple of issues with that. I just want to, to give you a brief word about it. So first of all, we had to use the S3 input. And the official um, plugin for the F3 input has a big flow, if we can call it uh, like that, is that it, it, when, uh, it starts by scanning the whole bucket. And since uh, you probably know, in F3, there's no way to actually um, uh, know by advance the, uh, the timestamp of, uh, of, of each object. So what he was doing is what is uh, actually uh, calling for each object um, the F3 API in order to get some additional details, which is very uh, resource consuming. So it takes a lot of time at the beginning to, uh, to start with. And then uh, it was only processing one file at a, at a time. Uh, there is another S3 input that is less official, or at least there are a bunch of uh, PRs open that are not merged yet, uh, that are a little better in that sense that they only call once uh, the API of F3, uh, with the latest version of Boto, it knows also how to process several, several files at a time. Let's say, for example, you decide to, uh, it downloads four files at the beginning, and then when it uh, finishes to uh, process the, the first uh, file, it actually already downloads the next one. In terms of encryption, uh, there is also some uh, filter that is, exists, but the problem is that it doesn't support multi-core, so we're still stuck, it was still uh, very slow. Um, we still didn't find a proper way uh, to do that very efficiently, but uh, it was actually okay uh, based on the scale that we had. This is the kind of uh, overview of the architecture that what we're dealing with in the cyber intelligence team. Uh, I will go back to the different um, uh, parts here, but basically what we're doing is that we're taking uh, files in F3, processing it uh, in, uh, using Spark jobs, then saving the results in another bucket in F3, and then maybe another job, and then finally uh, the results is served uh, through a Flask application and uh, to, to the uh, uh, enterprise API that is consuming it. So uh, Spark is an open source uh, computing uh, cluster framework that was developed and, and released uh, in uh, 2012, the first version, uh, by University of California, Berkeley and it is used to uh, do some data processing at scale. Uh, the idea is that you have one machine called the driver, and you have a bunch of nodes that are actually uh, getting 
part of the, uh, of the data to process, and then it's kind of map reduced. You're just getting all the results back to the driver. Originally, the best uh, and recommended uh, languages, language to uh, work with Spark is Scala, but you can also use Python. The problem with Python is that uh, it's not native, of course, and actually use a JVM. It actually, every time you're, you're calling a Spark function um, using Python, it actually, behind the scenes, using P, uh, Py, uh, 4J, and it's uh, calling for a uh, Scala function, which, as you can imagine, is not that efficient. On the left side, you have uh, one part of the driver, and on the other part, you have uh, on the different workers actually using, uh, using uh, piping uh, in order to uh, communicate between Python and the Spark worker. Uh, but it's not that bad in terms of performance uh, because of the new high-level API that Spark released. So originally, the way to work with Spark was using RDD. RDD is resilient distributed data sets, and it's a low-level object that you can uh, use either in Python or uh, in Scala. Uh, but as you can see on the graph, it's not very efficient. There is a big penalty uh, if you want to use Python. On the other hand, if you want to use DataFrame, DataFrame is another uh, uh, way to uh, uh, work with, with uh, Spark objects, but it's more high level. And actually, as you can see on the graph, when you're using Python, it's not that bad. Uh, and DataFrame has another advantage. Also, you can use some uh, SQL-like language in order to access the data. Originally, I say you have your files that are stored on F3. Now, the, the format of the file is very important. Because um, if you have, let's say, some uh, text file, let's say you are working with JSON objects, the problem is that um, you will need to load the whole file uh, to read the whole file in order to use the data. The parquets format is actually a way to uh, get better performance by only uh, reading what you need. What do I mean by that? So it's a columnar-based uh, format. And uh, here you can see uh, an example of uh, how, does it, how uh, it looks. But uh, what's the difference between a columnar-based format and a row-based format? So here I have three, um, three JSON uh, objects. And uh, here you can see how they're stored if it's a row-based storage. So it's object by object. And here it's a columnar-based storage. So you actually store the property, uh, the first uh, column, uh, together. What you uh, can imagine from that is that if I only need to select the title and the author, then I can only uh, read that part of the file and not the whole file, which is, very, which is saving a lot of I.O. Another uh, interesting uh, uh, property of Parquet is that it's compressed, and it also uh, support nested data structure, and of course it's supported natively by Spark. And another interesting uh, um, uh, property is that if you have two files of Parquet and each one has a different uh, structure, a different schema, uh, actually Spark knows how to merge the two, uh, the two files into one, which is uh, uh, very convenient when actually you're working with two different schema, because schema can evolve, you can, um, you can read both files, and, and that's fine. A, a bunch of tips about, uh, about Spark uh, with F3. First of all, prefer to use uh, LZO, because one of the things that with Spark is that if you want to distribute your data set with the different nodes, you need something, some format that can actually be, uh, that you can cut the, uh, the data uh, in different, in, in, you can split the file into different parts. If you're using gzip, you, you cannot do that. So as you know, it's, it's better for that. If you're using F3 over HDFS, HDFS is more expensive. Um, F3 adds some latency because you need all the time to download the data. Another interesting uh, thing about Parquet is that it knows how to uh, leverage data partitioning. So for example, if you want to, let's say uh, if you're using multi-tenancy and you have several customers, uh, what's interesting is that you can have uh, uh, you can save your uh, Parquet files in folders, and uh, uh, using Parquet, uh, it will know that the first column is the name of the, of the, uh, of the folder, which is interesting. And there are two, uh, two last tips uh, if you're using uh, Parquet. Um, I can uh, talk with uh, anyone who wants for several details. We're using uh, Spark on EMR. And this is an example of uh, Spark SQL and how, to, how it's very easy to actually load the data. You're just reading the, um, the different files that are stored on F3, registering a table just like a SQL table, and then you can do 
any uh, query that you want on the data. And you don't care about the performance because it's actually uh, uh, take, taken care of by all the nodes that you have in your Spark cluster. Spark for machine learning, that's interesting. Um, there are two ways of uh, doing machine learning stuff uh, on uh, Spark. Current way and recommended way still is using uh, RDDs and it's uh, a library called Spark MLlib. And as you can see, it already implements most of the, uh, of the uh, um, uh, popular algori algorithm. And um, there is a new way to, do, to um, leverage data frames, uh, which is still not uh, ready from prime time, and it's called Spark ML, and it's really uh, promising, but we're not there yet. So this is a quick example of uh, a few lines of code in Python, how you can actually uh, implement, uh, well, run a k-means um, uh, learning on, uh, uh, on some data set. An example of what we did is actually we're uh, we're running this uh, pipeline on uh, a company that had about uh, 5,000 uh, employees, and we were, were running uh, several clustering algorithms in order to actually fill the data. We filter out the noise at the end, and uh, what you can see here is that actually we discovered a bunch of abnormal locations. We had four uh, million events, and we finally uh, were, were able to uh, discover that we're only two abnormal locations uh, that we finally uh, put on the map for the, uh, for the customer. The data now that it's uh, wrapped up is uh, served by a Flask application, and we're using Docker in order to um, serve that to uh, our API. We're using AWS, and uh, we're taking uh, a benefit there from ECR, which is the uh, Docker repository, uh, in order to save our Im images. And uh, we're also using uh, ECS uh, for our containers. Using ECS uh, instead of uh, uh, doing uh, it by our own uh, is was just uh, easier. Uh, it supports auto scaling out of the box and also ELB. And finally, we're using Ansible to deploy. And if you want to uh, hear more about Ansible at scale, uh, I'm doing a talk next week at the Ansible IL meetup. So I'll be happy to, uh, to see you there. This is the results that we, uh, we got at the end. It's uh, a map of all the different uh, threads that we found uh, using those um, Spark MLlib um, algorithm. The question is that uh, uh, there is some uh, um, abnormality uh, in Africa uh, near Zambia, and uh, the question is uh, whether or not there is some data, data center there. So it's, it's not necessarily uh, a related data, set, data center. The thing is that um, what you can see here is um, all the uh, user activities. So every time someone is trying to log from anyone using internet, um, and it's a suspicious location because, well, uh, the company hasn't uh, any activity there, uh, the algorithm is finally uh, finding it. As I said before, uh, we're enriching the data with different, uh, different feed. And one of the feed is the IP reputation feed. And there, uh, there is some information about Tor. So one of the features that we can use in our algorithm is actually uh, looking at the uh, IP reputation, and if uh, it's uh, defined as a Tor IP, then uh, raise the alert. Thank you very much.